Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Tabrez Ibrahim. I am going to be helping uh, run this. I um, helped organize uh, this speaker series with Muslim Space. And I thought I would uh, do a quick intro here uh, before we get started. And just to let everybody know, today's title of the presentation is Natural Solutions for Anxiety and OCD. It is by Dr. Nafisa Sekandari, who is a licensed clinical psychologist. And I'll be the MC for this. I'll be asking some questions. We'll make this interactive and then leave time for Q&A. So first, I want to thank uh, the organizers for Muslim Space in having this. And it's been a great series so far uh, with a lot of time and effort uh, by many people uh, on the Muslim Space leadership. So I want to thank everybody uh, involved with the organization of this. I'll do a brief intro for Dr. Nafisa Sekandari and turn it over to allow her to introduce herself. Again, this is part of the speaker series. It's titled Being Muslim, and the title is Natural Solutions for Anxiety and OCD. And I'll share a little bit about, about uh, Dr. Sekandari, whose website is transformingxiety.com. Again, it's transforming anxiety.com. And uh, Dr. Nafisa Sekandari is a licensed clinical psychologist. She specializes in anxiety-based disorders and is also an award-winning author of Afghan Cuisine Cookbook, um, as well as the host of the Mental Health Break podcast and the CEO of Transforming Anxiety Online Training Courses. She's got a deep personal and family history of anxiety and OCD, and uh, she's an expert in this, as well as created a holistic and in integrative approach to creating long-term control of anxiety without, medication, uh, without medication or long-term therapy. Uh, she's presented professionally to state and national conferences, as well as local organizations, and she's represented the American Psychological Association and the Arizona Psychological Association as the diversity chair and has traveled to various places and advocated for mental health awareness, including to members of Congress. And she is on a mission to make uh, mental health accessible to the masses, regardless of where people live in the world, including here, uh, virtually with Muslim space. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Secondary to uh, introduce herself in more detail, if you have a little bit about her background, and then we'll go into Q&A. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Happy belated Eid. Um, and I hope Ramadan went well for everyone. And uh, uh, you all had a wonderful Eid with your families. But thank you for being here. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yes, my name is Nafisa Sikandri. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. And I do specialize in anxiety-based disorders. And the reason I do specialize in that is because like uh, Tabriz mentioned, uh, I have a deep family connection to anxiety and OCD. It runs very deep in my family. And I myself didn't really connect my issues to anxiety and OCD until I was older, until my daughter, or like right around when my daughter was born. And a lot of, before that, I just thought, this is just how I am. It's just a, a dark negative part of my personality, the things that I do, the way my brain gets stuck. And then I, once I made that connection that this is actually something that can be managed, something that I can treat, it lifted a lot of that negativity off of me and it empowered me. And so I'm on a mission in that regard and that the more I started sharing about my experiences and normalizing mental health as much as I could, um, I'm also um, the founder of mentalhealthformuslims.com, which I, um, co-founded with my cousin, Hossein Mujadidi. And the reason we did that is because at that time, there are so many people struggling with mental health issues, but there's so much stigma against uh, seeking help. And here I was, you know, I got my license. I was so excited. I'm like, okay, I'm going to open up my practice and people are going to be lining at the door, you know, wanting to get help. Nobody wanted any help. And even I was working at the school at the time as a school psychologist and so many families were struggling, but when I would suggest therapy or getting help, it's like, no, 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 that's not our problem. We don't, we don't want anything like that. And even when we called our website, mentalhealthformuslims.com at that time, this was in 2009. Now it's so common that there's, alhamdulillah, so many Muslims doing what I do, so many Muslims out there 
uh, supporting other Muslims and trying to normalize and destigmatize mental health. But at that time, we got so much backlash, like how dare you shed light on the mental health issues of the Muslim community? And we were shocked. We're like, we're trying to normalize this. We're trying to educate people. So that's where the mentalhealthformuslims.com came out. And we just wanted to combine Islamic teaching with Western uh, perspective, even though like the whole mental health thing is, is ours. I mean, Islamically, we had we have a long history of mental health treatment that a lot of Muslims don't know about. And, and we just assumed that everything just started with Freud and then the West, and that's not the case. But we do have some proven strategies and techniques that Muslims can use. And that's why I'm on a mission to talk about it, normalize it, share my own experience, share my own family's experience, so that people can feel comfortable getting the help that they need. Thank you very much for that intro, and um, we'll shift a bit. And also wanted to convey my greetings. I kind of skipped that uh, this time of year to everybody. Um, we'll go into what I meant by Q and A. Is I thought we'll keep this um, sort of interview style and just make this uh, sort of interactive with me and Dr. Secondary, and 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 then turn it over to Q and A from the audience. So for those that are listening, feel free to put questions in the chat window, and we'll go to those later. And uh, later, we'll also ask for people to, to raise their hand. So again, the, the title for this is Natural Solutions for Anxiety and OCD. And just as a quick overview before going into some of the questions, what we're talking about in this context is learning how to manage and regain control of anxiety and OCD without prescription medication by getting to the root of one's symptoms. And it all starts by doing a lifestyle inventory as well as being aware of one's genetic history. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well as what's happening inside the body in terms of brain chemistry, gut health, and overall lifestyle. And once you manage, uh, once you learn how to balance uh, brain chemistry and improve um, your lifestyle, you can feel more empowered and confident in the face of OCD and anxiety. So that's a bit of the description about this particular um, discussion that we're going to have. So let me first start off with the first question. What is the difference between OCD and anxiety? So the way that um, I describe anxiety and OCD is OCD is an anxiety-based disorder. It's, it's under the umbrella of anxiety. Under the umbrella of anxiety, we have panic disorders, we have generalized anxiety disorder, we have PTSD, we have all these different anxiety-based disorders under that, and OCD happens to be one of them. Um, so that's the, the distinction. So a lot of people can have OCD-type symptoms, but it might they might call it an anxiety disorder and not necessarily be, get specific about it being OCD. And I know there's a lot of um, controversy currently about people saying, well, just because you, um, you like things a certain way doesn't make you OCD. Just because you um, happen to be very detail-oriented doesn't make you OCD. And on the one hand, I don't want to minimize the, the symptoms that people go through that are on the way I look at OCD is on a spectrum disorder. So there are people that are on the low end of the spectrum where they might their brain might get stuck, but it's not causing a lot of issues for them as far as it being debilitating. But there are people that are higher on the spectrum that it is debilitating for them. Those are people like if you've ever seen the movie As Good As It Gets, uh, you see Jack Nicholson and how he had to sit at the same spot all the time and he had to do certain things a certain way. And he just was very, his world was very small. And so when I'm talking about uh, OCD for the general population, those people might be falling somewhere between moderate to low end of the spectrum and not in the debilitating part of it. Um, but I truly believe that the solutions that I've come up with and that I've used with my patients over the past 15 years, apply to all levels of the spectrum because I have family members that are all over the spectrum, whether that's on the OCD spectrum or the, on the anxiety spectrum. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, it's very helpful. I think it's a good start um, and helps set the context here. Um, in terms of those that that haven't been diagnosed with either um, anxiety or OCD, as you've been talking about and describing about it, so someone that's not been diagnosed with either, how do you, how does one know that one has it? So I, I think there are certain symptoms that people have that they know something is holding them back. Something is standing in the way of their succeeding or the way of them accomplishing things. There's, there's fear that that's overwhelming fear 
there's irrational thoughts and beliefs. So a lot of my patients, they come in, they're like, I, I, I don't feel good. This, it's causing all these problems, but I've never been diagnosed with anything. And I myself haven't technically been diagnosed with any uh, with anxiety. Nobody in my family has been technically diagnosed. But you, once you know what it is and you see the pattern, you start identifying it and you start recognizing it in other people. It's not just about being nervous. There's the nervousness factor of it. And then there's your brain getting stuck on irrational thoughts and beliefs. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, for a lot of Muslims, uh, it's the religious aspect of it that gets impacted. The religiosity that I get contacted so much about uh, as far as like it's impacting the, the way they pray, it's impacting the way they worship, it's impacting their belief system. So without really, it, there's so many different ways that this can go in terms of OCD and anxiety, but um, it's about understanding the symptoms and seeing that there's something stuck, there's something standing in your way. Like for me, growing up, it was affecting my relationships. I would get very angry really easily. I was a very sensitive child. I personalized a lot of things. I would get my feelings hurt really easily because I would assume things. I would catastrophize. My brain was very black and white and it's thinking. It was either all good or all bad. Um, uh, once I was stuck on an irrational thought or belief, it was very hard to, to, for me to be reasoned with. And then the anger issue, what I've noticed is a lot of people with OCD get angry really easily because they have a certain concept in their brain of how things are supposed to go. And when it doesn't go their way, they, they get really irritated and they get very angry. Like I used to have road rage. I used to have a lot of anger. And I didn't, I didn't make those connections that that was anxiety and OCD based until, um, and it wasn't even my, my programming because going through my program and studying all this stuff, they focus, of course, with all medical issues on the extreme end of the spectrum, right? Because that's when you're supposed to intervene. There's no proactive uh, part to the, to the training. And so I didn't, none of that applied to me. But once I started understanding it more and I started observing my family members, I was like, that, that is all OCD, that is all anxiety, but it's not being called that by most people. So once I started talking to other people that have OCD and have been diagnosed with it and they're mental health professionals, and we were like, yeah, this is what it is. We are identifying that in ourselves and in other people. Then that became clear that it might not necessarily be diagnosable, but it is enough to cause problems for people that they can do something about it and not suffer with it. Great, thanks. That's that's very helpful. Um, and so to continue this discussion, I've still got uh, several questions before we'll go to Q and A from the audience. But the next question is: uh, We've been talking about anxiety and OCD. Can anxiety and OCD be genetically inherited? It's, I think, highly genetic. And like I said, it runs deeply in my family. I mean, you could literally, like I said, once you know, you can pick who the main like. Obviously, I don't know what my great grandfather's issues were, but my grandfather was very was very famous for his OCD behaviors. And so then you see different people in the family having those issues. And the more I talk to my family members, the more they're at first they're like, there's no because you hear the word disorder and you think it has to be debilitating. And it's like, well, I don't have that. But I was like, but once we talked about it and I was like, well, this is what you're doing. You're getting really stuck in this situation and you're really intense about this situation. Then they started seeing the, 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 those aspects of it. But one thing I want to say is when I talk about OCD, I truly believe OCD is one of the best disorders to have because OCD, although it can be debilitating and can, can cause a lot of issues for people, it can also create a lot of positives for people like those people that have super clean homes and for those people that are very diligent and get super good grades and they're they make great employees they go above and beyond the call of duty they're there early they leave late they put 100 and 200 percent on their job that's also OCD and anxiety driven but the difference is that I want like I don't want people to not have clean homes or not get good grades but it's a matter of not allowing anxiety to be the driving force, but you using anxiety and OCD to make you successful in life. And so for that reason, when you can use it to your benefit, it can be the best disorder, but it unfortunately causes a lot of problems when it's unmanaged and unrecognized. Got it. Okay, great. Um, that's helpful. Uh, with 
regards to one particular thing, just Ramadan ended, so we've, uh, you know, many people have been fasting, and so food may be new on people's mind. Uh, the follow-up question here is, what does one's diet have to do with being anxious or obsessive? It has everything to do with it. And so that's the, one of the reasons that I have been able to, in the past 15 years, not refer any of my patients to a psychiatrist for medication. And one of the reasons I'm such a big believer in natural solutions for anxiety is because I focus on a holistic uh, model of treatment. And diet plays a huge role because our gut bacteria when they're not healthy, they're not releasing the feel-good chemicals and the brain chemistry that's dependent on not being, being stuck or being calm and being more rational, serotonin is at the root of that. When our serotonin, serotonin levels are normal, we're more flexible. We, we don't get stuck on negative thoughts. We're more flexible. We can go between tasks. Uh, we're more flexible in our views. We don't have the black and white thinking. We don't get stuck on one or the other. We see the shades of gray. And the reason for that is the majority of our serotonin gets released in the gut. 80 to 90% gets released in the gut. And so when our gut is unhealthy, when we're not eating the right foods, when we're not feeding our gut bacteria and we're not creating a healthy gut biome, then, then we're not releasing the feel-good chemicals. So on the one hand, I talked about the genetic disposition of it. So we do, some people do genetically inherit that. So it's, it's important, like, I have patients coming into my office talking about, well, our son is a very OCD or very anxious. We don't know where he gets it from. And then when you break it down, you're like, who in your family? Like, is it the mother or the father? Which one of you guys are, are anxious? And they're like, well, I've never been diagnosed, but I have, I do some of the similar things. Or my husband's uncle does some of the similar things. And so it's important to know what is our history, knowing who in your family members, like doing those family trees, who in your family has a history of depression or history of anxiety or history of, of OCD or gets their, their brain gets stuck or they can be very militant and very that they get, they get into arguments all the time or they hold grudges and they can be very strict. All of that is the genetic connection and making you who you are. But then at the same time, that can be the predisposition for it. But if your gut bacteria is unhealthy, if your brain chemistry, if your brain is not getting the nutrients it needs, then that's going to make those symptoms so much worse. Worse. So for me, I have this deep history of anxiety and OCD, but when I started changing my diet and changing my lifestyle and changing the things that I ate and making sure that I was feeding my gut bacteria and making sure my brain chemistry was balanced. I had no issues with OCD and anxiety being uh, out of control. I was able to redirect it within seconds and not really have an issue with it. And that's my goal is to make sure that people are able to regain control of their lives so they're not dependent on anything external, but they're making mental health a priority 24 hours a day and making sure that they're taking care of themselves mentally and taking care of their gut and paying attention to what they're eating. So if you're eating junk food, and you're eating foods that are not good for your gut, then you are going to be more anxious. You're going to have more issues with depression, with concentration, with attention, and, and with being more, uh, getting more stuck and having more anger issues and more mood issues. Okay, so, so you've talked a little bit about um, anxiety and OCD in the context of um, genetics and food. And it just, you know, I've got a question that, Team up here in terms of, are there, just as a follow-up, since we have this, and before we're going into other questions, are there specific foods to increase intake of uh, in order to balance the serotonin release that you've been mentioning? So again, are there specific foods that uh, you could recommend? There are specific foods. There are serotonin-rich foods. Uh, so we need protein. We need healthy carbs, like not processed foods but a lot of vegetables. There are certain vegetables like bananas, for example, like I didn't know I had, I had severe social anxiety when I was in high school, but I had no idea that I was medicating myself when I was using bananas. Bananas are rich in serotonin, rich in tryptophan, which converts to serotonin. And I was eating a lot of bananas and I was kind of like dependent on them because it, they made me feel good. They made me feel happy. They made me feel energized. Um, 
And so it made my brain feel calm. And a lot of people do end up eating a lot of simple sugar carbs, like a, a lot of the processed breads and pastas, because that also calms our brain. And so a lot of people that are on a keto diet and they're severely restricting carbs, even the breads and the pastas, they tend to be more intense, more aggressive, more angry because they're not getting that, that serotonin hit. They're not calming their brain. But I would recommend to not to be dependent on those simple carbs because they do elevate your blood sugar and that's not really good for you. But eating a lot of healthy uh, vegetables, uh, salmon, for example, is very rich in tryptophan. Turkey is rich in tryptophan. Beets are rich in tryptophan. But you can't just eat, eat a turkey sandwich and then have a bunch of chips and soda and expect that to do wonders for your body. It, there really needs to be a lifestyle change. And um, so it's important to incorporate these things, but also remove the toxins from your food, remove the toxins from your environment, remove all the plugins and the, and the uh, artificial scents and, and deodorizers from your life, because all of that is causing issues with your hormones. So they're disrupting their endocrine disruptors they're disrupting your natural sex hormones, which are also causing mood issues. Cause think about a woman before her period when her hormone levels are off and if her hormones level levels are imbalanced, she has more intense PMS symptoms, right? And so our hormones also play a part. It's not just our gut, it's our hormones, it's our brain chemistry. And it's really important to really pay attention to all that to make sure that we're mentally, emotionally and physically healthy. Okay, thank you. I'm sure in the Q&A from the audience, we'll probably get some more questions on the food part of things, since it's something I think everybody pays attention to or should be, I guess. Um, okay, so we've talked about, again, um, with regards to genetic inheritance with diet, the next question is about sleep in terms of what does one's sleep have to do with one's mood and overall mental health? And again, I'm going to say everything, but it's like, these are all like the most important things. I have a lot of people coming in, their lives are a mess. They're, they're really struggling mood wise. They're really struggling with their relationships. And when you do like an inventory, when you break things down, they're, they're up all night. They're not getting any sleep. They're getting notifications all night long, especially teenagers. Um, they're connected to their phones 24 seven. They're not getting that deep rest that they need. I'm uh, such a believer, like even this Ramadan, I was um, very, very religious almost about my sleep schedule, because if I didn't get enough sleep, I would have been a mess the next day. And it's like, it affects you on so many levels. Um, and I know a lot of people, like they eat a lot, like for Ramadan, for example, they would eat a lot during iftar, and then they would eat a lot of carbs and sugary stuff because they hadn't eaten all day long. So they were eating a lot of junk at night, and then that would disrupt their sleep. And they would wake up and for sahur, and then they would eat a lot more junk food. And then the next day, all they would do is sleep all day. So they would turn their whole cycle, their sleep cycle was all messed up and upside down. I've literally had patients. I had a patient that uh, was very uh, severe with her OCD. Ramadan would completely mess her up because she became psychotic uh, when she wasn't getting enough sleep. She had to stop fasting because the fasting was completely messing her up. She would go to these tarawih ter prayers and come back at 11, 12 o'clock at night and then be up all night doing tahajjud and qayyum prayers. And so she was really, really ruining the, her body and then her OCD became extreme. And the same thing with other mood and depression issues. And I know that this causes a lot of uh, mental health issues when we're not doing the right things for ourselves. Yes, we're supposed to do our fasting, but we also need to make sure we're eating the right foods when we're breaking our fast, but that was for Ramadan. But for regular, um, our, our sleep schedule is messed up. We are on our phones 24 seven. We don't get enough sleep. We are either watching something on our phone or we're up watching uh, Netflix all night long. And it's really important for us to get the sleep. And studies have shown that because we are synced with the setting and the rising of the sun, we need to be asleep by 10 o'clock because between 10 and 2 a.m., 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., that's when our melatonin level is at its peak and we end up getting the most deep sleep. And I have this ring here that, that monitors my sleep and I, I keep track of my sleep and I keep track of my deep sleep, my REM sleep. The majority of my deep, good quality sleep happens between 10 and 2. And so um, if I end up going to sleep like, you know, 
I'm Afghan, so some of our parties might go away into the night and like our weddings and stuff, we might come home at three. I am a mess the next day because I didn't get that deep, deep sleep. I didn't get enough. And so our REM sleep happens mostly towards the morning. But of course, it's go, it cycles throughout the night, but most of our REM sleep happens towards the morning. And then most of our deep sleep happens the first part of the night. And so we need to get enough deep sleep because that's when our body rests and repairs itself. We need to go into that coma-like sleep so that our body can wash itself of all the, the clutter we've collected throughout the day, but also repair our body and, and release growth hormones and balance out our other hormones and, and, and heal our gut uh, bacteria. And then our liver, if we're eating a lot of really bad foods, our liver gets activated at three in the morning and that disrupts our sleep. So we need to make sure we are prioritizing our sleep. We need to make sure we're prioritizing our our diet and all of that is connected. You can't separate them and just be like, okay, I'm gonna eat well, but then I'm gonna stay up all night and that's gonna be okay. We need both. Thank you, um, That's that helps. I mean, we've covered a good amount of ground on the genetics. Uh, we've talked about diet and sleep. These are key parts. We've got a couple more questions and then we'll turn it over to audience Q and A here. Um, in terms of just sort of uh, steps over the long term, so what are some steps for calming one's brain for the long term control of anxiety? So I would start like we've talked about a lot of things, like we talked about genetics, we talked about lifestyle. So I would start with creating a baseline. I I would really it's so important to make sure that uh, you take inventory of what's going on in your life. You take inventory of where are you right now? What are the symptoms that you're dealing with? What are the symptoms that you're struggling with? And be honest with yourself. So I would journal out my daily activities. I would, uh, from what I'm eating to what time I go to bed, what's the quality of my sleep? So you might not have a ring, but you might have an Apple watch. Maybe the Apple watch can be used for a week to measure your sleep and see what time, what time are you going to bed? What's the quality of your sleep? How rested are you when you wake up? And then uh, like, how do you feel? Take inventory of your current relationships and what are your connections like? How would you rate them from on a scale of zero, to, uh, one to 10, one being the worst and 10 being the best? What's the quality of your relationships? Are you finding yourself getting into arguments with people? Are you finding yourself getting, uh, holding grudges and being unable to forgive? Um, and then what's your relationship at work? Are you able to get along with people? Are you um, finding yourself not happy at your work? Are you excited about doing the work that you are doing? Or do you feel like you're not being taken uh, seriously? Uh, and then pay attention to your self-talk. What are the things that you're telling yourself on a regular basis? So a lot of us, when we uh, do something, we're like, oh, I'm so stupid. I can't believe I did that. I'm such a loser. Pay attention to all of that because that's your automatic negative script that, that kicks in. And that is going to determine how you're reacting to everything. And then, and because the only thing we have control of in our lives is our reaction, right? So if we're feeling like we're being criticized unfairly, we're being judged unfairly, we're being, um, nobody understands us, um, all of that, then we are going to react differently. But if we are more balanced, we're more, we're eating well, we're going to bed on time. And then I would also, make a plan. I would make a plan as far as like, okay, my sleep is awful. I go to bed at one or two in the morning. I want to go to bed at 10 and, and reap the benefits of it. But I want you to know that you're not going to be able to go from one o'clock in the morning to 10 the next night. You're not going to be able to fall asleep because your body is, is used to going to bed at one. So you have to slowly train your body by 15 minute increments a night to go to sleep at, at 10 o'clock. You, I don't want you to go to your pantry and throw everything away and then replace it with good foods because that's going to be very expensive. So slowly, like maybe whatever you have in your in your kitchen right now, finish that and then replace it with healthier options. Uh, there are also supplements you need to take. Uh, I know that there are a lot of doctors that are like supplements are a waste of money. You don't really need them. On the for the most part, that's true, because the majority of supplements are garbage. They're literally fillers. Like. A lot of these places like Walmart, Walgreens, uh, Target, a lot of them uh, got busted for selling vitamins that were literally just fillers. They were just expensive urine just being flushed down the toilet. 
So make sure you invest in good quality vitamins for you, made with food, sweetened with food, dyed with food, no artificial fillers, no artificial anything um, that's going to work against your body. And so there are natural supplements that you can take that can calm your stress response. Uh, caffeine, caffeine's a big one. A lot of people with anxiety and OCD, they drink a ton of coffee that makes them more anxious. That's not going to help you. You have to reduce that intake, at least not drink it first thing in the morning because that's your cortisol levels are already high. And when you add caffeine to that, you're making your cortisol go, your stress response is even more, it's even stronger. So you're going to feel more anxious throughout the day. Um, so I would rather, if you're going to drink coffee, limit it to one cup and then take it maybe at 10 in the morning, but not too late because then it can keep you up in, at night as well. Um, but those little changes for a lot of people can seem really overwhelming and really difficult. So, so start slowly, slowly go from like, if you're drinking your coffee at five in the morning, delay it by half an hour, delay it, delay it as much as you can until it can be 10 o'clock. And then maybe have black tea first thing in the morning instead, because black tea has uh, amino acids in it that makes us feel calm, but gives us that mental alertness. So there are certain little tweaks you can do, incorporating more protein, making sure you're getting a protein, a good carb, and a healthy fat for every meal, limiting junk food, limiting snacking. Um, so those are some of the suggestions that I would do. But I would start with a with a good solid. Um, uh, what was I saying? Like an inventory, like a baseline, a good solid baseline. So you know exactly where you are. Like if you're starting a, a, a gym workout, you want to know what, what do you weigh? What are your muscle? Like what, how much, what are the measurements for your biceps, for your waist or whatever, so that you know, are you adding bulk? Are you adding muscle? This is the same thing. Do a baseline, do an inventory, an honest inventory of where you are right now. Are you emotionally a mess? Are you more emotionally, um, easily angered, easily weepy, easily uh, reactive? Are you taking things personally? Are you getting stuck with irrational thoughts and beliefs? Or is there a lot of fear standing in your way? Put all of that down and then apply some of these changes one at a time and see what is making a difference because that's the only way you're gonna know if you're making progress or not. And I tell all my patients to do this because I don't want them dependent on me forever. And a lot of them will start doing all this stuff and they do really well and they do such a good job and they feel great. And then they stop therapy and they're like, I, I don't need it anymore. I'm cured. And then they'll come back and they're a mess again because they stopped doing all those things that were working for them. So my goal for everyone is to prioritize our mental health 24 seven. Pay attention to what you're exposing yourself to. A lot of people wake up with the news, they go to sleep with the news. That is the worst thing you can do for yourself because you're putting your body in a state of anxiety and in a state of fear, and you're increasing your cortisol levels. Uh, a lot of people are watching a lot of movies that are very toxic and, a, and very violent. And so all of that is having an impact on us mentally. Um, we might be praying, but we're not taking the time to really slow down our day. We're not taking the time to meditate. We're not taking the time to calm our overactive brain um, by making sure we're eating the right foods, taking the right supplements. So those are some of the things that I would say get started with. Those are good, helpful tips, I think, to start with. I see some um, questions coming up. We'll turn soon in a moment to audience Q&A, but one that's come up is about basically different ages. So the question is, uh, before you go into other questions, are there specific lifestyle modifications that are uniquely beneficial to younger people like kids and teens that can help reduce anxiety or OCD? So I guess it's an age-specific one for younger people. Are there specific um, lifestyle modifications that are unique to these? I feel like the young people are having the most problems because they're not they're not eating well, they're not sleeping like they're supposed to, they're constantly connected to phones. Younger kids as young as like two or three are attached to tablets and they're addic addicted to screen time. And so a lot of them are struggling. Like I have patients as young as five or six years old that have OCD. One of them was about to be put in a special education classroom for emotionally disturbed children um, because she was having so many meltdowns. She was so rigid and some of the things she was doing she everything had to be her way she was so stubborn she was just having constant meltdowns 
And then when you talk to the family, they're just like, well, we, there's nothing we can do. That's just how she is. But that wasn't, she had a TV in her room. She was watching it late at night. She was constantly on that tablet. She was eating junk food. She, she would eat school lunches. She would have cereal for breakfast. Those are, all of those are, are terrible ingredients for, a, for good mental health for children. And then the teens are having even more of a hard time because they're constantly connected to their friends via social media, via, and then constantly comparing themselves. And then they're eating nothing but junk food. I mean, I ate nothing but junk food when I was a teenager. I had horrible acne. Uh, I was eating nothing but burgers and fries. But all of that's considered normal. And that's what normal teenagers and normal kids eat. And that's not okay. We need to do better for our kids. Because what's being found is that when you have mental health issues as a child and as a teenager, it only gets worse when they're older if it's not managed and it's not treated and, and you're not doing anything to improve it. Great. Um, so I've got one more um, question and then we'll turn it over. I, I see many folks in the audience and I'm guessing there'll be questions. I've got one more before we do this sort of audience Q&A. Should one consider medication if one's symptoms do not improve? You can try medication, but I would definitely, like, uh, there's a psychiatrist that, um, that I really like. His name is Dr. Daniel Amen. He's a, he's a psychiatrist that does brain scans. And I know that a lot of people that believe in medication as the first approach might not necessar necessarily like his approach, but he always says, why use a hammer when you can use a softer approach first? Why go to, the, to that extreme unless you've done all this other stuff? And what I found is the majority of my patients, like I said, when they do, when they follow the, this regimen and they follow the, the, the rituals that I talked about, like making sure their, their brain chemistry is balanced, their gut is healthy, they're, they're going to bed on time, they're eating well, when you, and they're meditating and they're taking care of themselves mentally, physically, they're journaling, they're exercising, they're going for walks. When you do that, when you prioritize mental health that way, you don't need medication. And if you want to try medication, that's fine. But what I found is I have patients coming to me taking medication and it's not working. So they need a different approach. If medication was the answer, if medication truly was the end all be all, we wouldn't have mental health professionals, right? Nobody would be coming to me because medication would take care of it, but it is limiting. It's not going to be enough. It doesn't necessarily fix everything. So even if you're choosing to take medication, you still have to do these other things just to make your medication work better. So we've we've learned a lot, and I'm gonna guess that there's gonna be many audience questions. So to make this uh, go in a you know way organized way, uh, I see some questions coming up here uh, already. Feel free to drop your questions or comments here in the chat window. Uh, you can put that there uh, yourself to everybody, or you can send it to me. My name is Tabrez Ibrahim. You can see it on the window for me or uh, you can raise your hand. There's an electronic hand uh, raising option as well, and I'll call on you. So there's different ways we can do this. Um, I'll start off with the first question that's sh uh, showing up here. Um, what do you say when you go to the um, you know, sort of leader of uh, Islamic faith uh, with any sort of mental health issues? I would guess this is like an imam or sheikh, um, and their response is simply to just pray more. Yeah, that is unfortunately the issue within our community. And, and a lot of uh, imams are becoming more sensitive to mental health issues. I've actually participated in imam trainings. Uh, and it's not just uh, unique to our religion, because a lot of Christian and Jewish uh, leaders say the same thing, that there, this, there's not, this is nothing more than a weakness of faith and that you should just pray more or you're having depression and anxiety because you're not a good Muslim or a good Christian or a good Jew. That is not the truth. You know, there these mental health issues exist. They've existed even at the time of our prophet. Uh, they he would send certain foods to people that had different issues, different mental health issues. The, there are Muslim scholars that uh, the first mental health uh, hospital was in, in in Baghdad, Iraq, and so the, we have a history of mental health treatment. So I don't understand these imams that focus only on prayer 
when they should understand that these mental health issues do exist. It's not just about praying more. Um, and we need to educate ourselves that prayer is definitely beneficial. It, it definitely calms the mind. It definitely calms the soul. Uh, du'as and Allah is obviously the most merciful and grants us the, the peace of mind and the, the calmness and fixes our lives. But we also have to, to do something. It's like what they say is God helps those who help themselves. We also have to do things. We can't just have a toxic lifestyle and then just go pray more and expect it to get better. We have to do our part to make sure that, I mean, if we're focusing on religion, then we need to be very appreciative for what Allah has given us. He's given us this amazing body and an amazing brain. And he's giving us this, this what they said, we'll call it our temple, whatever. We need to make sure we're respecting it and we're honoring it and we're taking care of it. And we're giving it the nutrients and the exercise and the rest that it needs so that it can do its job and, and, and give us the, the life that we want. We can't just abuse it by doing drugs and uh, vaping or marijuana or whatever people are doing or being exposed to smoke, cigarette smoke and toxic ingredients in our, in our household product and then expect it to function. We still have to take care of ourselves and it's just more than prayer. I really feel like we need to take that responsibility on ourselves to, do, to go above and beyond prayer and to make sure we're taking care of ourselves in that way. That's a, that's a very helpful response. I think a very common situation of that question, unfortunately, uh, you know, one uh, experiences. Uh, I see some other ones uh, coming up here. So I'm, I'm seeing questions come up, uh, corresponding with a few folks here. Um, the next question was based on the earlier discussion about serotonin. Um, the question is, what are good, what are good sources of serotonin? I think you covered some of this, maybe uh, it's uh, additional sources or um, seems like a, a, a question based on the earlier uh, discussion. So yeah, I addressed it food wise, but there are other things that you can also, um, there are amino acids that are very, very helpful. Uh, like I mentioned, the amino acid and green tea, for example, theanine is an amino acid that calms their brain down. There, is a, there are adaptogens like holy basil and ashwagandha and maca that kind of calms us down. Um, the tryptophan uh, amino acid is very powerful for, especially for OCD, because it raises or na naturally raises our serotonin levels. But I don't want to recommend taking anything that's going to naturally raise your serotonin levels if you're already on an antidepressant, because uh, something like uh, like tryptophan, for example, that might raise your serotonin level like a faucet, like turning on the faucet in a sink. But an antidepressant is the plug to that sink. So if you're increasing your serotonin and there's a plug in the sink, you're going to have an overflow and that can become very toxic and very deadly. So I would never recommend raising your serotonin levels um, with supplements uh, if you are already on antidepressants, but you can eat more serotonin rich foods. That, that's fine because you're not consuming enough to overwhelm your system. So making sure the best thing to do is tryptophan is an amino acid and an amino acid, you want to eat foods that have all the amino acids. So proteins have all the amino acids. A, co a complete protein has all of the amino acids. So you want to make sure to get for every meal, a, a, a good source of protein and a good source of uh, carbs, like could be veg vegetables or whole grain breads and things that are not going to instantly convert to sugar. You want to have fiber and you want to have a good source of fat. So if you can do that for every meal and even for your snacks, so a snack could be um, uh, hummus with vegetables, uh, could be a really good source of protein, fat, and carbs. Uh, having avocado toast with, uh, with eggs uh, can be a good, a good breakfast for having your, your protein, your carbs, and your fat. So if you can do that, then you're getting enough uh, amino acids in your system to naturally raise your, your uh, serotonin levels. I hope that answered your question. And then you can also Google serotonin rich foods as well. Thank you. Um, another question is about generational trauma. And uh, the question is, uh, generational trauma seems to have an effect on one's mental health, but what one sees regarding cultural or generational shifts within the community or even within a family, is that what it is? Is that what generational trauma is? 
would you see that uh, regarding cultural generational uh, shifts within a community or even within a family? And as an example, it seems like immigrant parents, which may be many of those in the audience listening, and their American-born children who may be labeled as third culture kids. So the the, the broad question is about um, generational trauma and the effect it may have on one's mental health. Yes, and I, I don't know if they're in, in reference to, is this genetic or is it generational trauma, right? I mean, I don't know if that's, that's what they're basically asking. Um, it's it can more be about generational because, and like I mean, cultural I, Right. I, um, I was born in Afghanistan. I, um, e even before we immigrated and before all this stuff happened, I had uh, anxiety. I had issues with anxiety. My grandfather had issues with anxiety, but at the same time, I immigrated under a, a, a terrible conditions. There was a war. We snuck out in the middle of the night. We left everything behind. We came to a new country, um, dealt with all of that, the war, the, the being displaced. And there's a lot of trauma involved with all that. And then the depression of my parents, losing everything, having to start over, all of that definitely impacts us and impacts our mental health. My parents were not very emotionally available at that time because they're learning a different language. They're working to make sure that we're surviving. Um, there's a generational gap between us. All of a sudden we're speaking more English and we're not really connected. And so there's like this misunderstanding, but it was for it was because of all of those reasons that I dedicated my my uh, doctorate to that my my dissertation um, to understand what is happening because a lot of people are coming with a lot of trauma. Like we were lucky, we left pretty early during the war. There are people that witnessed a lot of like family members getting killed in front of them, being complete like family members being raped, being displaced, living in in a in a refugee camps and not really having much to eat. And then coming to America and, and then be having to survive. And then their kids are joining gangs, their kids are joining, their kids are doing drugs. So all of that impacts our, our mental health. We're all, that's just the Afghan community. All Muslims from so many other countries are dealing with similar issues. And so we are, we do have that issue, those issues. And a lot of us, there's a lot of shame instead of saying, you know what? Yeah, I do have that history. I do have that, that, that traumatic past. I do have a lot of negative experiences in my family and my family might not be mentally well and there might be a lot of abuse and a lot of verbal and emotional abuse that's passed on as normal behavior. I could pass that on to my kids and call it normal like oh this is just generational trauma or I could put a stop to it and say no I want to be the one that this stops with. I want to fix myself. I want to heal myself. I want to go get treated so that I don't end up messing up future generations. The, the sad fact is a lot of us do, in this country, a lot of us do have generational trauma. And I did, uh, when I was doing my, my research for my dissertation, there at that time, again, this was only 2005, six, there wasn't a lot of information on uh, trauma and generational trauma within the Muslim community. So I had to use the history of trauma within like the Jewish community, what they went through with the Holocaust. People, the survivors of the Holocaust, a lot of them, just like the Afghans, they came, they survived, they came to America, they didn't speak a word about it because they didn't want to, they felt guilty, they felt, they felt survivor guilt, they didn't want to talk about it, they felt like, who am I to complain when my family members back home are struggling and they're suffering, when their family members have gone through so much war and destruction and trauma, who am I to complain? They didn't say a word. But what they found was their grandkids showed similar symptoms that they should have had. So this is being passed on generational wise, genetic wise, without the grandparents ever saying a word. And that's happening in our communities. When I was doing my dissertation, I wanted people to share with me their experience. Like, what was it like leaving your country? What was it like coming to this country and struggling and surviving? And, and what was it like to be a parent under those conditions, nobody would talk to me. They would tell me, no, it was great, it was fine, we're so happy to be here, we're so grateful, trying to put a positive spin to it when I knew for a fact that that wasn't the case. Like my own parents were very sad and very depressed, but they would never say that they were because they were like, who am I to complain? So it was up to me, and the reason I actually became a psychologist is because I wanted to understand what the heck was happening with me. 
Why did I have the issues that I had? Why was I so insecure, so terrified to even speak up in class? Why was I so terrified to go in front of the class and do a presentation? It was more than just me being an immigrant. It had to do with like the insecurities that I inherited, that I watched my family, the fear that surrounded all of that. And so it took me a while to even like, it wasn't after I graduated. It's not like my psychology degree helped me understand all of it. There's a lot of work I had to do, a lot of un unfolding, a lot of healing, um, and a lot of unpacking that I had to do in order to be able to under understand it all and put it in context and not just say, well, it's just, it's part of our history. It's part of our culture. I, I think it's very relatable, your comments to what maybe I think uh, many of us uh, from immigrant populations or know people of uh, immigrants and dealing with this um, generational trauma. I'm going to, I was scanning to see if there's other questions coming up. I may jump in and ask a, a question myself with maybe moderators type privilege here, but um, I'll see if others have questions, but I, but I have one. Uh, this is Muslim space. And so there's many Muslims here. And my question is about uh, the sense of how Islam provides a sort of a spiritual response to many of the issues that you're talking about with anxiety and OCD. That is, um, what are your views on how Islam itself may provide some sort of, um, you know, nourishment or emotional well-being and what may be guidelines from a, like an Islamic, uh, particularly Islamic spirituality uh, viewpoint on dealing with uh, um, anxiety and or OCD? I think, I think it provides everything we need on the one hand. It definitely does. But on the other hand, throughout the Quran, it says, this is for those who understand. This is for people who reflect. This is for people who uh, have the ability to see the whole context, right? There's a, the, one of the reasons that scrupulosity is becoming an issue or ha probably has always been an issue within the Muslim community is that a lot of people focus on, they zero in on the, the sinning part of Islam or the, the not being saved or the fear based of it, or that I'm not going to go to, to heaven or whatever. And then they become, that's what the scrupulosity is. They, they feel like nothing they do is good enough. And they, there isn't, they become more anxious around religion instead of feeling calm by it. And so I feel like it takes a lot of understanding and reflection and a lot of like practice in order to get to that level to benefit from some of the things that are in the Quran because everything is there for us but I don't think a lot of us are putting in the time to really understand and practice in a way that could that, that can calm and soothe us um, some of us are doing it out of fear I know for a long time when I was praying it was just an oblig obligatory thing and we get this done and we get it done quick especially when I have this OCD brain it's like boom 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 go to the next one uh, finish my prayers, go do something else and do this, do this, do, and I'm very scattered. I'm all over the place. I'm very distracted. I'm not sitting in reflection and I'm not sitting with my thoughts. I'm not, uh, doing the meditations in a way that's calming my brain. So if somebody can do all of that, Islam is a complete package. It has it all. But if you're already feeling anxious and you're already feeling like you're not good enough, you're not praying enough, you're not doing it right, you're creating more anxiety around it, then you need more help than that. It's not going to be enough just to pray. I hope that answered your question because uh, I'm not an Islamic scholar, but I know personally for myself, uh, it needs. I need to do more than just pray and just read the Quran and just uh, observe my religion. I think it's very helpful. I think it aligns also well with what you uh, said earlier. Uh, there's a follow-up question also, a uh, continuation of the earlier comment on uh, Muslim religious leaders and community leaders. The question is, uh, you know, in the discussion we had earlier, what more can Muslim um, religious leaders and community leaders do to help destigmatize uh, uh, mental health issues um, and offer help and support to members of the community? I truly believe that all of our imams and religious scholars need some kind of a mental health training. I've met some amazing imams that are very much on board. They're educating themselves. They're going to mental health tra uh, uh, training so they are not 
misguiding the congregation away from treatment. But studies that sadly have shown that when presented with case studies, a lot of the imams would say that the issues, like let's say a case study about depression, they will more likely say that's a, a faith issue, that's a lack of practice issue as opposed to a mental health issue. So until that changes, until they can recognize what is a mental health issue, I, I feel like they're not going to be able to send them the, the, to the right, in the right direction or be supportive of them. Like people that come in and, and for example, they say, my husband's abusing me, I'm in a very abusive relationship and uh, I'm miserable and I might commit suicide. They're like, oh, you need to be patient, you need to be tolerant, you need to change what you're doing. Maybe it's you, maybe you're not cooking more, maybe you're not cleaning more. It's on you basically that your husband is doing all of this. That's the wrong advice. And that's sadly uh, contributing to the high level of suicide in our, in, our, in our communities. I never thought I would see suicide being an issue in our communities because we might be suicidal, but in the past we never would have gone in that direction but it's becoming an out for a lot of people now because of that lack of support and guiding guidance in the right direction. And then the stigma towards getting help for mental health related issues. So I've got a follow-up to that. I know you said earlier, you did some trainings for um, Muslim uh, religious leaders, community leaders. I guess my, my question is how many or like what percentage um, you feel lack this training? That the, the earlier question here was, what can Muslim religious leaders and community leaders do since you work with them? Do many, do some, most, none uh, have this kind of training and how, um, I guess, needed is this right now? Like how much of that populace knows about these issues based on your experience? I'm just guessing off the top of my head, but from what I've been hearing from patients, um, like literally one of my patients called out an imam when he was telling somebody, like somebody stood up and said, this is what I'm dealing with. And he's like, you just need to pray more. She had gone through therapy and she felt strong enough to correct him and say, that is not the correct thing to say. This person needs help. You need to guide them towards getting help and not creating stigma around mental health. So I, off the top of my head, I'm, I feel like it's being generous to say maybe 25% of the imams have this kind of training and 75 probably need, if not more, need to get this training. I think we're getting um, more and more people are interested, but a lot of them are not, for, uh, there's still such a huge stigma in the mental health, uh, in the Muslim community around mental health, and that needs to change. I'll see if there's other questions and maybe uh, share more of your website. Maybe some of the ones you're, um, you're referring to could uh, benefit from this. Again, the website is uh, transforminganxiety.com. And, and do you offer, it sounds like, uh, these trainings uh, to imams and religious leaders, community leaders? Is it just individuals or is it uh, what sort of folks are, are your clients? I provide support like I so I get a lot of people from around the world contacting me about having OCD issues, religiosity issues, anxiety issues. And I because of licensing issues, I can't work with anybody outside the states I'm licensed in. And right now I'm licensed in California and Arizona. So those are the people that I work with directly one on one. And because I can't work directly one on one with people, I've created courses that um are basically everything that I would tell my patients in a course, like it's it's kind of like this, but it's recorded for somebody to watch at their own pace. And, and then I have a membership attached to that where we meet monthly and we talk about um, follow-up questions that people might have, but it's not. And, and the reason that I'm able to do that is because I'm not providing one-on-one -on -one direct therapy to people because I'm not able to do that outside of the states I'm licensed in, but I can do educational things like this, where I'm talking in a, in, a, in a place like this, where I'm talking about it, but I'm not necessarily directly uh, working with you one-on-one -on -one with your personal issues. And it's, not a, and it's not a therapeutic relationship, right? So the courses are set up like that, where you're getting the information at your own pace, but then you, we all meet once a month to kind of talk about uh, questions that might come up or things to the, 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 that might, might come up that need to be addressed, or maybe follow-up information might be shared. Um, so that's how it's set up for people. 
So no matter where you are around the world, you can get the training that you need. You can get the help that you need so that you're not dependent on me. You're not dependent on anybody else, but you can really work on managing your anxiety and your um, OCD. And so those courses are available for individuals that can use it for their families. And as far as training for the imams, I did that with organizations like a, a community effort. We did it here in Arizona, but I know that uh, Michigan, is it Michigan State? Uh, with Dr. Farha Abbasi, she offers mental health training where people can actually go through their program and get certified to say that we've been through the mental health training uh, as imams so that they can feel confident working with people or at least directing them to the right uh, sources. Thank you. And again, um, on the uh, chat, you see a link um, here that's provided to Dr. Secondary's uh, website here. It's um, transforminganxiety.com. So it's in the chat window as well. I asked the question that was on my mind. I'm going to scan really quick here to see if there's other questions um, and see if anybody would like to uh, put anything in the chat window or electronically raise their hand. I see a raised hand here. So I'm going to put myself on mute. It looks like uh, uh, maybe Shadia from Muslim Space. Hey, sound like um again, uh, great, great talk. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. Um, one sort of side question. Uh, I believe in the introduction, Tabrez mentioned something along the lines of a uh, Afghan cookbook. Uh, where can we learn more about that? Any? Uh, uh, you can, yeah, it's called Afghan Cuisine. You can find that. It's an Afghan Cuisine a collection of family recipes. You can find that on Amazon. Fantastic. I will Google that now. Thank you. Thank you. I I did find that. I just Googled it very quickly and I see that on uh, Amazon. Great. Uh, good to see. Yeah. Let's see if there's other questions. If not, we are um, at about an hour and this has been very informative and uh, I've learned quite a bit. I'm sure others have as well. Uh, it's been um a really nice uh, session. And I see a question here that's come up. Uh, how can you convince a parent to go to therapy and seek treatment? And following that, it says older generations do not believe in treatment. Uh, do you have any advice? Thank you. And great talk. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, therapy only works when people are willing to go. I don't ever want anybody to feel forced. Um, like I did work in prison for a year and they had a captive audience, literally, like it, even for them being forced to go to therapy, it doesn't become successful when they're feeling like they have to go. So what I would do is I would educate them about certain things that there may be um, maybe articles that they could read or videos that they can watch that talk about mental health in a way that normalizes it so that they're not um, feeling like they're being ostracized in any way. And then Maybe if you are the one going to therapy, you can invite them to a session. They can see that it's not threatening because a lot of people, they come and they're like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. I don't know what to talk about. I don't know how does therapy work? What are you going to do to me? Are you going to shrink my brain? What are you... It's like, that's not how it is. It's just the conversation that we're having. But a lot of people, because they've never been, it can be very overwhelming and intimidating. But if you can do maybe like a family session and invite everybody to go and they feel comfortable being heard and talked um, to in a way that feels like they're being listened to, that could be motivating enough for them to go see somebody, but never make them feel like you have to go or making them feel like there's something wrong with them and that's why they have to go. So if you can present it in a way that's um, like even children where people are like, my kid needs help and you need to see them and you need to fix them. I was like, I don't work with kids unless they want to work with me because they will sit there and they will play that whole waiting game. Like you can't make me talk. Like you're right, I can't, I'm not here to force you. So you want them to be willing to go, but the way to do that is to educate them of what it looks like, what therapy is about. They can always quit, give them the option to leave whenever they want to, but they maybe you can make them go to one. And if they go, they, they have the option of whether they, they, they wanna continue or not. I hope that helps, but it has to be done in a gentle way because we don't want therapy to be a punishment. We want it to be a source of support. At the bare minimum, give them a journal to write out their feelings and their emotions um, in whatever language they feel comfortable writing so that they start 
paying attention to their thoughts, to their feelings, and to have an outlet to get it out so that they're not bottling it up. And if you guys have follow-up questions and you want, you, you can follow me on um, Instagram. I'm a Dr. underscore Nafisa underscore Sikandri, Dr. underscore Nafisa underscore Sikandri. So you can follow me there and then you can send me messages, uh, pro direct messages on Instagram. Um, you can always email me as well, the, directly from the website. Uh, but I am available if any other questions come up for you. Well, thank you. Um, uh, there's a link in the chat window to your Instagram um, page. And we put also earlier the website, again, transforminganxiety.com. Uh, I'm going to scan to see if there's other questions or electronic hands here. Um, I don't know if I see any because I think we've covered so much ground. This was really well, um, you know, really well done, very informative, a lot of really helpful thoughts. Uh, I learned so much and thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your insights, uh, your expertise with us. I guess if you have any final thoughts, feel free to share and then we'll, we'll wrap up here in a moment. Well, you're welcome. And it was my pleasure. If, uh, like I said, I am on a mission to help people not suffer. There's no need to suffer with anxiety or OCD. It's highly treatable. It's something that um, you can feel empowered to use, to make it useful for you instead of allowing it to control you and feel like you're being controlled by it. I have this little guy here that I always talk about, but this is this little guy. You know, we talk about in Islam that it's waswasa in our brain, but in, in non-Muslim therapy, this I say this little guy is in our head just controlling us, but he's like a toddler. He doesn't know a lot. He just freaks out like chicken little just freaks out about everything. And then we react to it and we react with it instead of calming it down, instead of being reasonable and rational with it. And those are tricks and, and skills that you can learn so that it's not so that you can make this guy work for you because he's a very good servant. He will help you be very, very successful, very clean, very organized, but you're in control of all that instead of allowing the anxiety to overwhelm you. So um, don't, don't be afraid to seek help. Uh, find people that specialize in OCD and anxiety in your area. You can use psychologytoday.com to find therapists near you. Um, you can find places, if you can't afford therapy, you can find places like uh, government agencies or hospitals. Like we have Arizona State University and Midwestern University here that offer therapy for $25 a session. You can find places like that. I had to do 50 hours of therapy before I graduated and I found somebody that was willing to give me a deal because as a student, even $25 a week is a lot. So there are ways to get therapy. Just make sure you, you don't give up on yourself. And if you're struggling in any way, go talk to somebody. It could be life-changing for you uh, and not allow the stigma to stop you from getting the help that you need. So that's that's my final word. Thank you for having me. I've, I've enjoyed this conversation. It was wonderful talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Uh, I also wanted to, uh, again, reiterate you know, the website. Uh, it's transforminganxiety.com. And I also want to thank uh, the folks at Muslim Space Leadership and Shadia and others uh, for having this. Also, the Muslim Space website is muslimspace.org. Uh, you can find there the calendar and many other uh, exciting things going on. So I uh, wanted to thank uh, folks at Muslim Space for having this uh, great speaker series. There'll be more, there'll be more announcements. So we'll wrap up uh, there. Thank you, everyone. And uh, it was very informative. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Assalamu alaikum.